Aloha and welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Coming to you from Waikiki Beach, we had really our first really big south swell of the season. The waves came all the way up from Antarctica. Uh, I was out surfing on Sunday, and uh, there was a contest out at the surf break in front of my house called Queens. So I had to go way outside Queens uh, paddling I was, as I was paddling by, and I saw a dark wave, which means it's coming out of the deep way outside so I was already way outside and then I saw a big one coming and uh and it was uh I, I paddled out for a good three minutes farther and further and further out and I'm on my stand up paddleboard so I can see a wave coming a long ways. And I turned and I uh I was able to paddle and it's not just that it was a tall wave, it was thick. It was like uh the roof of a house almost the way it broke and it was so clean. I dropped in, and I'm basically surfing right towards Diamond Head, which is in the distance. And just one of those moments I'll never forget. It was a big. It was huge. It was like being in God's hands. And then I kicked out, and or out the wave kind of dropped back in deeper water because I was way out, probably not a mile out, maybe maybe a third of a mile out. But then um, I needed to come back in, but uh, I saw that the competition surfers were – continuing all the way through and connecting to another reef over to my side. So I thought, well, i got to be careful. I'll get in trouble if I go through the contest zone. So I'm paddling uh, paddling in, and uh, my board pearls, which means that nose dives under the water. So here I had this big wave in front of all these people, and I looked so amazing. And then I, I pearled my board and wiped out in a little <laughs> one-foot wave, two-foot wave. And I'm working my way in again, and it happens again. So I just kind of sheepishly, you know, <laughs> come up to the beach. But the Lord has a way of keeping us humble. You know, he, he, he reminds those of us, some of us who have more visible ministries, don't worry. God knows how to humble us at times. But I had a great experience. And later that day, I went up to the Benedictine Monastery on the North Shore, and I was able to make my full profession as an oblate. I've been a, a novitiate since 2010. So uh, it's like being the longest white belt in the history of a dojo or something. But they finally let me become a member. But today's show... I have someone that who I just, I wish I was Mike Aquilina. That's who we have on our show. You know that old saying, I want to be like Mike? I want to be Mike Aquilina. Uh, for those of you watching the YouTube version of our show, you can see he's surrounded by books. And and the smell of books too, right, Mike? <laughs> Isn't it beautiful? It, it does have that, that, that the distinctive smell. Yes, it's beautiful. Do, do you remember when you, your first book was published? Do you remember opening up and smelling it? Oh, yeah. 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 It's about uh, my 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 uh, literary manager goes, your books are the tomb or whatever it's called is on its way. Uh, when you get it, smell it because an author, <laughs> an author loves the smell of books. I mean, it's just part yeah. of what the, what we love. But uh, Mike Aquilina, you've written over 60 books now, 70 books. I think no, it's, it's over 50, though. So you're trying to catch up with Dr. Peter Crape. <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm not. I, th I think it's good for me to stay stay behind him because uh, he's in another league. Well, I, Dr. Kraft is almost up there. Well, he's almost going to pass Louis L'Amour, Louis L'Amour's oh, yeah? cowboy books, right? I think I, ha I have the full collection, believe me, of Louis L'Amour oh. westerns. Yeah. I think uh, my father did, too. Oh, I loved him. My, my first editor uh, uh, was his last editor. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's at, cool. Uh, at Hachette Books. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I have a and, and he was Ray Bradbury's last editor, too. Wow. Yeah. And he started the Star Trek series and the Star Wars series for Bantam, I think. And he did the, and wow. he did the romance novels. Hey, that was his Kuliana, too. So quite a pedigree. Yeah, That's quite great. A pedigree. Yeah. But we're, we're with Mike Aquilina, who I love so much. And Mike, one of your favorite things to do in the world is to go out and do public speaking, right? <laughs> I have a dread terror of it. Me, too. I just, but, but you speak all the time. You must be on the, you must be speaking a couple of times a month or four, more, huh? How many times a month are you speaking? Something like that. Because every Something time, like that. Tomorrow I'm back on the road. Every time I want to schedule an interview with you, you go, well, I'm, I'm speaking. But I remember we were together in Kansas City and I just remember I was dreading getting up there too. And we were like in the green room and, and we both <laughs> admitted it to each other. And now we text each other sometimes before we speak. Yes. Yes. I count on your prayers. But the thing is, is the subject today, the thing that I, I asked you to talk about, is it's something that I really would love to have someone speak with tremendous clarity about. And I couldn't think of anyone better than you. Uh, and so this is going to be one of those, those uh, conversations, I think, that will go to the very core of the Father's love for us. 
and our love for mm -hmm. him. Mike, why do we have a sacrifice of the mass? Can we just start out with what is the word, what does the word sacrifice mean? Sacrifice is a, is a simple word, really. Uh, it, it's a compound of two things, uh, two, two Latin words. And, it, and at root, it means to make something holy, to make something holy. And, and that's what a sacrifice does. It takes some common object, some possession, and it makes it into a gift or an offering to God. It surrenders the possession to God. So if we if we look at primitive peoples, this is something that's almost universal. Uh, when they when they have religious instincts, impulses, what they do is they they offer sacrifice to the greater being, the supernatural being. And if we look at ancient religions, whether we're looking at at uh, the religion of Israel or the 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 um, the the pagan religions around Israel we find religions of sacrifice. This was a universal condition. Usually it involved the shedding of some animal's blood. You know, blood was offered in sacrifice. Animals were offered in sacrifice. And the, and the, the, the offering was thereby made holy. It was made a sacrifice. Um, I would say something further about it, that the, the object that's offered, the gift that's given, is always symbolic of something greater. It's always symbolic of a giving of oneself, um, so that when we offer an animal's life, we're offering that animal as a sign of our own life. We're offering that animal in place of our own life because we deserve to die because of our sins. We have sinned against an almighty and infinite God, and, uh, and we don't deserve to live after that. We've broken his law, but we offer this animal as a, as a symbol of our, of, of our own lives and, um, and of our future love. Let's talk a little bit more about um, that religious impulse, mm -hmm. because people will denigrate uh, the Old Testament uh, offering that was done uh, in the temple uh, because they say, well, everybody was doing it. But there is something innate in man when you, you said that religious impulse that almost universally uh, w causes them desire to want to give to this great unknown God. And in, in pagan yes. religions, maybe there was numerous gods, but there yes. was this there's this impulse within man. I was reading through the catechism this morning on my morning show about how every man has the still small voice of God. Everyone mm -hmm. knows in their heart that the law is inscribed on their heart. It's not that we all, it's not that we copycatted each other. It's that it's deep within our nature to be a worshiping, uh, to be a loving, to, be, to, to uh, you know, look at, look at around your Waikiki. All these people are here. Why aren't they all, why does everybody congregate? Why is there this gathering of people everywhere yeah. you go? Uh, because we're, we desire relationship. Yes. And the greatest relationship with is, is with God. So how do you differentiate, um, you know, that talk about that religious impulse? Well, let's talk about it in terms of, of human love, because that's something that we might understand a little bit better. One way that I show my love to my wife is by giving things up for her. You know, when somebody gives me a couple of tickets to a football game, right? And I have the tickets and I look at the date on the tickets and I see that I've already committed to visit my in-laws that day, you know, and I, and my wife has it on the calendar and she's looking forward to it. If she knows that I gave away those tickets, she, it's valuable to her. Okay. She knows that I'm giving up something I want to do so that I can do something she wants to do that what she wants is more important to me than what i want and that's symbolic so my sacrifice is symbolic of my life i give you everything i have i give you my time i give you my life what what is mine is yours um i i think that that's that's the kind of love that's expressed in every sacrifice in the old testament it's a complete gift of self the the the, the, the victim itself is just symbolic of the greater love that's behind it. And, you know, the, the, the requirement uh, in the Old Testament was first fruits, unblemished mm -hmm. lamb, to give the best. 
Yes. And, and, and that, that's, a, that's a example of what you're saying. Like with your wife, you don't give her the leftovers. That's right. You're giving that's her right. your very, very best. And so that sacrificial animal is just symbolic. Uh, how, how can you reach a, a cosmic, eternal spirit, you know, God? Yes. But you and can, Israel, mm-hmm. uh, the Israelites often got in trouble because they offered second best or right. third best or fourth best. You know, they, they, uh, they were supposed to offer an unblemished lamb. Oh, well, you know, I have this lamb. It's a little lame. It's not going to fetch me any money in the marketplace. Maybe if I just put a little shoe polish over the blemish, that'll take care of it all. You know, um, that's not a good thing. You're not fooling God because God does not need the lamb. God Amen. needs your love. He require he desires your love. Yeah, oh, we're talking that's we're, it. we're talking with Mike Aquilina. We're gonna keep we're gonna keep talking about this. We're gonna really go deeper with this. Uh, Mike Aquilina, who just the thought of him gives me joy, and and every time I get to see him, I just can't believe I get to talk with him. He's <laughs> got such a, he's sold out for Jesus. That's for sure. Mike, where can the they go? To, where can they go to? Uh, what what website should we send them to? Fathersofthechurch.com. Fathersofthechurch.com. And if you're going to describe Mac, Mike Aquilina, that's what you'd be talking about, the early church fathers. Uh, and you can go to, by the way, deepadventure.com. Get there right after the show. Get your stuff to send to your, fa- to your father for Father's Day. Uh, hey! My, you go to Mike's, Mike's, too, and get his books or get my books. We got whiskey mugs, beer mugs, coffee mugs, uh, c- cigar samplers, my seven virtue cigar samplers that we created. Uh, we got all kind of stuff there. So go there and get your Father's Day presents there because you probably forgot already and you got to get ready for that. This is Bear Wozniak with the Bear Wozniak Adventure. We'll be right back with more with Mike Aquilina. Aloha, and welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. We believe at Deep Adventure Ministries that the most radical thing you can do in life is abandon yourself to the wild adventure of God's will. You know, when you go out into nature, you think, well, this is as close to God as I can get sometimes because you're, you're seeing everything in its, nor- in, its, in its natural form. But what do we call that? We call that the wild. We call it the wilderness. And that's the kind of life of adventure God has for us. When we abandon ourselves to his will, uh, it gets a little bit wild. You know, we don't know exactly uh, where God's leading us or what he's up to. I love Mother Angelica's picture when you walk into EWTN Studios, this big portrait. And she has this this look on her, this kind of glimmer, this kind of like mischievous look like, okay, what's taking you so long to get here? And secondly, I know something you don't know, and it's going to be involving a real adventure. So um, we're with Mike Aquilina, who lives that life of adventure. Hey, Mike, when you're when you're just when you're just like living your normal life, you're driving down the in the car. Uh, like, are you thinking about Anna, uh, uh, Athanasius or like? <laughs> I, I mean, aren't you? I mean, I am. I'm thinking about oh yeah, when Athanasius, when Saint Nicholas punched out Arius. You know, I'm think, I li- I kind of live in those history books. I I spend an hour or two every day reading that stuff too, and. And you just kind of live there, and it, they inspire us so much, don't they? Uh, they're great stories, for one thing. You know, the stories of the past, and they're inspiring, and they hold us to a high standard. They do. Um, but but also, um, you know, we're dealing there with people who are still alive. These men are in heaven. They're Amen. in that great, cl- great cloud of witnesses. And they're with us, and they're cheering us on as we as we we kind of play it out on the field here. So um, so they're still with us. We can call on them for intercession, and I do. Me too. And so when I'm reading Saint Athanasius, I'm like, or or, or you know, Thomas Aquinas. You know, like, can you explain yeah. this to me, Saint Thomas? But <laughs> um, when I got uh, when I made my profession uh, as an oblate in the monastery, I took Athanasius as my 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 Benedictine name, even cool. though he wasn't even though he wasn't Benedictine, he was forerunner of all the monastic uh, things, having written the book about St. Anthony of the Desert and stuff. That's right. But yeah, don't you, and when you walk into that that beautiful opening at the Vatican, the St. Peter's uh, the Square there, all those statues of those saints, powerful looking dudes, and yeah. women too. Yeah. It just really inspires you. And I've been reading, really studying uh, deep uh, the life of St. Paul right now, you know, um, an academic sort of going deep of his, his the, the, mm-hmm. the culture of every city he went to and things like that. And it just, you go, dude, what am I doing? I need to get to work. Uh, I need to share the gospel. But my, Aqu- Mike Aquilina, 
We want to talk about this word sacrifice again. Yeah. Can you give us a, again a, 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 a go over once again how you would describe uh, the word sacrifice? Well, at root, it means making holy. All right, and it's a gift or an offering to someone greater than than you are, uh, a supernatural being. Uh, in biblical religion. It's an offering to God. That's how you make something holy, by consecrating it, sacrificing it to God. It's an act of love. You know, and, and as Christians, we see the ultimate act of sacrifice in Jesus' self-offering. When he was there at the Last Supper, he made that offering. He made it in sacrificial terms. He said, this is my body, and this is is the cup of my blood, the chalice of my blood. So he 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 presented himself as a sacrificial offering, the bread or the body separated from the blood, the blood taken from the body. And then he made that as an offering to God. And then he said, do this in remembrance of me. But it was not consumated until he said it is finished when he was on the cross. And I that's love- when it was consummated. I love that when he said, you know, the word holy, I, I believe, means to, to, to be set apart. Yes. Right. So the sacrifice is this. I'm giving this to you, Lord. Yes. What, what gives man his dignity and his incomparable worth is not just that we have a spiritual, rational soul, which is the animals don't have. They just have a soul. Uh, is that Jesus became incarnate. He became man. And in yes. that cosmic way that only an eternal being and a God himself could do, he took on our he became all man but he, he became one with human nature and so when he said when he offered himself he was offering all of us he was he was offer we join ourselves to that sacrifice we don't we offer jesus to the father but we offer ourselves to the father too during mass so he becomes one with us and in so doing he's saying look i'm giving all of humankind back to you lord you know we have that free will whether to accept that or not but there's this great cosmic thing that went for throughout time and space, back in time, forward in time, everywhere. If there's, li- you know, just everywhere in the universe, this cosmic offering of. So does that have something to do with it? The solidarity with mankind. Let's do this. Contrast for me Martin Luther's false teaching on penal substitution vis-a-vis how Catholics understand what it means to have of the sacrifice. Let me try something different. What okay. I want to do is take it back to creation, okay? All right. Because you bring up a good point. Our Lord took on our human nature and recapitulated all human history. He elevated it. He restored it. He completed human nature. What is that human nature? Well, when, when we look at the creation of Adam, we see that Adam was given the garden, and he was told to guard it and keep it, Right? The two words, the two Hebrew words that are used for that purpose um, are only used in the Old Testament together to describe the work of the priests in the in the tabernacle and in the temple, the sacrificial work of priests. So Adam was created to be a priest and to offer sacrifice. And what was his sacrifice to be? It was to be the entire world. He was given stewardship over the entire world. Be fruitful, multiply, fill this, offer it, right? That's what he was to do, to be a priest in the sanctuary of creation. But he failed, and he was expelled from the sanctuary because he had profaned it. When Jesus came as the new Adam, he was a high priest in in the line of Melchizedek, and he restored the priesthood to humankind. When we're baptized, when you and I were baptized, we were given our share in Adam's priesthood and in Christ's priesthood. We were baptized into that priesthood so that we can make our lives an offering. We can make our work an offering. This desk that I work on every day, this laptop that I type on every day, those are holy altars on which I offer sacrifice. I'm not killing animals here, all right? right? <clears throat> but I'm of, killing it, you know? Yeah, I'm yeah, typing. You, I'm doing off, my work. You're offering your, your life's work uh, and yeah. your life to the Lord. And, and that's so, how we're restoring creation in a cosmic way. 
Yeah, it's it, it, because Jesus had solidarity with mankind, he could do that. Yes. It, and, and having lived, he didn't say, you know, I, I've heard it said that Jesus came for one reason, and that was to die on the cross. Mm. But Jesus came, he said, to fulfill all righteousness. That's right. That's he right. Lived, go ahead, go. <laughs> <laughs> You're absolutely right. You know, he came not as our substitute. He came as our brother. He came to empower us to do as he did. All right. You know, we are to go after him and follow in his ways and imitate him and to work with him. You know, Paul said, it's no longer I who live. It's Christ who lives in me. He's the one who's working through my hands when I'm doing my work. It's his blood that's coursing through my veins. It's his flesh that that's in my body as I'm doing my work that I got to do day after day. It's not a matter of substitution. He came to empower us to live as he lived, to die as he died, and to make our life and death an offering. In my body, I make up what is lacking in the suffering of Christ for the sake of his body, the church. In my flesh, I make up what is lacking. What's lacking in the suffering of Christ? Only what he willed to be lacking so that I could do it. That's what a big brother does. He says, he doesn't do it for you. He shows you how to do it. He lets you grow up in the, into the same kind of life. And that's what's so unique about Catholic teaching. Uh, yes. The dignity of the human being. Yes. Is so, you know, Martin Luther um, <clears throat> had this novel concept of penal substitution, which is basically most Protestantism buys into, that Jesus came for one reason, and that was to to go to, to be, it's like I, I heard uh, when Governor Alqui once say, I think, uh, I forget the, the man who was the break-in guy for Nixon, when he, Chuck Colson, when he was being, uh, he was convicted, and then Alqui said, look, Chuck Colson's p family is not doing so ill or something, I'll take his place and go to prison for him. And that's penal substitution. You know, I, mm. I'm going to go to, the, I'm going to go to court, and God the Father is going to be in heaven, Jesus is going to go to the cross, and God's going to judge him for my sins, and 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 Jesus is going to pay the ultimate price, and be and, and and die for my sin, and then that then the judgment, the just judgment of God will be visited on him instead of on me. So it's kind of like God saying, "Don't sin, because if you do sin, you're going to die." But but never mind, I'll die instead for you. It's it, it it's. I'm going to have you uh, develop this thought when we come back in in in, uh, in 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 less in a short minute, okay? It just explode the myth of penal substitution for us when we get back. I don't think I did a good enough job explaining it, but we're going to explode that myth. This is Bear Wozniak with the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Not, uh, uh, buying into penal substitution vis-a-vis -vis understanding that God the Father's love by, give, by giving his son uh, to us in, in love and Jesus giving, us, giving himself to us in love. What a contrast. Uh, we'll be right back with Mike Aquilina. This is the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Aloha and welcome back to the Bear Wozniak adventure. We need to get a, we need to we need to deal with Jesus. We need to get you know the the great scandal of the cross. Why the cross? We need to deal with that. We need to understand that. Uh, Martin Luther had a very dire uh, self concept of who he was as a person. He had real low self esteem. Let's put it that way. He had some real issues. He believed. As, along with, I believe it was Calvin too, Zwingli perhaps, perhaps too, that I think it was Calvin though that voiced it most clearly when he said, I think it was Calvin that said, "We're just a pile of animal dung, and God's love covers us with like a blanket of snow, and and so we're forgiven, but deep down inside we're just animal dung." Um, and by Jesus' death on the cross, Jesus took my place on the cross so God could judge him for my sins. And, and that's, that's basically Protestant uh, teaching on the cross. Catholic teaching is so much different. Can you, can you clarify what the Catholic teaching is and then, and then uh, comp uh, compare that to what we call, what we would refer to as recapitulation or redemption? Well, the, the, the Church Fathers taught a doctrine of divinization or yes. deification, which those are shocking words. They say that God became man 
so that man could become God. We find those words in the early Christians going back to Irenaeus and even even further back um, in, 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 uh, in the documentary trail there. Um, this is the way they looked at it, that, that, that our Lord became what we are so that we could share in his life. And there are so many passages in the New Testament that give us that doctrine. You know, our Lord himself, when he was when he was uh, on, uh, here on earth preaching, he he even quoted the psalm, you are gods, because he had come to give us what St. Peter called in his second letter. He, he give us a share of the divine nature. St. Peter said we have become partakers of the divine nature. That's amazing. It's mind blowing. We should be asking ourselves, what does this mean? What does this mean for me to be saved? Well, it means I'm saved from my sins. Yes, but not only that. You're saved from your sins so that you can share in God's life. S salvation from sins is necessary, but it's only preliminary. It's the, the penultimate step. The ultimate step is to share in God's life. And that's what God gives us in the sacraments. We become partakers of the divine nature. When Jesus gave himself in sacrifice at the Last Supper. It was completed on the cross. And many times in the New Testament, we find this referred to as a once-for-all sacrifice. It's once for all, but it's not once and done, because our Lord said, do this in remembrance of me. He established a sacrament of his offering, a sacrament of the sacrifice, so that we would share in it in the way he intended, as long as there was life on earth. So God um, offered a sacrifice. God the Father gave a sacrifice. Yeah. What could, be, what could a father do? What could be more of a sacrifice than for a father to give a son? <laughs> well, you know, you think about it. Um, Jesus' sacrifice on the cross um, was really just an image in time of God's life. In eternity it was a complete giving of self what goes on in eternity well we have the life of the Trinity the father pours out his own life in love for the son he gives everything he holds nothing back that's the way Scott Hahn always puts it and the son returns that love to the father he gives everything he has he holds nothing back and the love that they share is the Holy Spirit this is the life of the Trinity in heaven, and it's the life we see on the cross. It's the life we receive in the sacrifice of the Mass. God himself gives us his body, blood, soul, and divinity. Jesus gives us his flesh and his blood. And, and God himself doesn't have anything more to give us. He's given us everything he has so that we can share his life. It's, yeah. it's amazing. Yeah, you know, and it's not just, it's, I shouldn't, I'm not minimizing it. Jesus gave his all, but the yes. Father did too. That, God the Father's view of Christ on the cross was his ultimate gift to, to mankind in his son. It wasn't him saying, hey, I'm going to put all these, their sins on this guy, and I'm going to, you know, cause him to die for their sins. It, it's such yes. a perverted view of a sick mind that would teach that. But historically, Catholic teaching has always been, this is God's, God the Father gave us sacrifice. God the Father gave his son uh, for us. First, we need to look at the Father giving his son. Then we look at the son giving his life for us to the Father. And then we need to see ourselves there with him in solidarity, offering ourselves to the Father through Jesus. And by thus, we enter beatitude and we become partakers in his divinity. Go ahead, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> and through the Son, the Father gives us the Holy Spirit so that the Holy Spirit dwells in us as, as, uh, as the, the source of unity in the church, as the source of integrity in our own person. This is a beautiful, beautiful reality that we see in the second chapter of the Acts of the Apostles, that God pours out the Spirit upon the church. All of these people, thousands, we're told, receive the Spirit on that Pentecost Sunday. And where, and where, and who, and from who does the Holy Spirit proceed, Mike? Proceeds from the Father and the Son. The Father some and the Son. The Father. That's right. And the Son. And the some Father of the ancient... and the Son send us the Holy. Their, their love is given to us. Their, both of them, not just the Father. The Father yes. and the Son give us the Holy it's, Spirit. It's the mutual love 
of the Father and the Son. That's the way the Holy Spirit. That's the way the Holy Spirit is portrayed. Some of the fathers of the Church say that it's it. Uh, the Holy Spirit proceeds um, from the Father through the Son, which amounts to the same thing. But it's so beautiful that the, this the, the Holy Spirit is this love of the Father and the Son. So when Jesus came, uh, he offered us, he offered his his human nature, but he also gave us his. <laughs> when he went to the Father, that's why mm -hmm. it's so cool. The, the Holy Spirit didn't come to man while Jesus was on earth in his resurrected state. Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit came to man when Jesus went to the Father, and there they were, and they sent us the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. Yes. So beautiful. Yes. So the, the letter. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, Mike, go ahead. The letter to the Hebrews shows us Jesus ascended to the throne, taking his place at the right hand of the Father. It also shows Jesus as the eternal high priest, perpetually, perpetually offering his body and his blood to the Father. And that's what we take part in, what we participate in when we go to Holy Mass, every single time we go to Holy Mass. Okay, so now let's take a little trek. Adam and Eve. Uh, he, they covered themselves with a fig leaf, but God uh, killed the first animal in a sense. He covered them with uh, uh, an animal skin, right? You see from the very beginning uh, a sacrifice in that sense. You do, and you see, you see sacrifice as a constant theme. But it's very interesting that even like right after the story of Adam, e Adam and Eve, the next story we have is the story of Cain and Abel, which is all about sacrifice and what and what was it that Cain offered Cain offered the his fruits as a farmer the fruits his harvest but the difference is Abel offered what a Abel offered a lamb Amen. Abel offered a lamb. yeah and, and so there was blood but there was blood uh, and it, it's interesting um, you know I think that the it wasn't so much what they offered but the but what was inside when they offered that that uh that um that Cain was was really holding something back. He wasn't sacrificing with a pure heart. How do we know that? Because he wasn't thinking about God. He was thinking about Abel, and he was sitting there with envy of Abel. And, and there, we could we could bet that there was a lot of a, a track record between between and the so, two. And so so there's so many different levels when you read the Old Testament. But we do know that there uh, there was the acceptable offering was because of first the heart, but that yes. also the symbol of blood. And oh, then yeah. we see then then we see um, we see Melchizedek before Abraham offers his sacrifice with Isaac, right? What makes well, Melch or, or was oh, he, he? We see Melchizedek first, I believe, correct? Yeah. And Melchizedek yes. he offered uh, wheat and wine, I think, didn't he? Both bread and wine. Bread and wine, bread which and again wine. is the symbol of blood, the wine. But yeah, bread and wine, the Eucharist, the the, the cross. Mike, you gotta make you got one minute to make this point before we gotta take a break. Go for it. <laughs> I see you about ready and to Melchizedek, leave. Melchizedek Melchizedek is the first person in the Bible to be referred to as a priest, and he's offering bread and wine in sacrifice. And we don't even know where, where the heck he came from. He says, Where where did this guy come from? He's not a Hebrew. Very shadowy. Right? Yeah. Right. Very, like, and he and he comes in and and later he's referred to in the book of Psalms. And he's referred to again in the letter to the Hebrews. And all of the time he's referred to as a type of the Messiah, a, a priest king. He, he is foreshadowing Jesus in an important way as he's offering that bread and wine. And I, I, love, I love it. We, we, a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Jesus, mm -hmm. Jesus wasn't, le wasn't a Levite, but he's our high priest. No? We're going to get right back. We're going to talk more about this as we carry through this theme about sacrifice the whole nature of sacrifice is to give our very best for someone. We'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak adventure. You can go to my website, deepadventure.com, or you can go to the Fathers of the Church.com, Mike. Is that right? Fathers of the Church.com. Okay, yes. good. We'll be right back with more. Aloha and welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. I'm your adventure guide, Bear Wozniak. I'm talking with Mike Aquilina, and if I don't get this plug in uh, first, we never will because when when uh, 
Mike and I, as the interviews continue, the talk story time continues, we're like a horse racing for the barn at the end. You know, we smell the alfalfa. We never, we never quite get there before the, the show ends. So uh, go to my website, deepadventure.com. There's all kinds of stuff there for your father, for Father's Day. Uh, books, of course, and our, our, our cigar samplers, our Seven Virtues Cigars, which, by the way, we are going to be hosting the um, – or help hosting the cigar nights at the Napa Institute this year, Mike. Nice. We're bringing it. We have, you know, we have our seven virtue cigars. We, all seven virtues, uh, premium cigars, different cigar for each virtue. And there's a label on there, beautiful label. And inside is a quote from one of my books on the virtues. So, <laughs> so I mean, it's cool. We got we got all kinds of stuff for the fathers. But um, okay, there now. And Mike's website is thefathersofthechurch.com. Okay, we got that out of the way. Now, Mike, I'm just going to take this little. We could go a little bit more. Now Abraham uh, is called to bring his son, his yeah. only his only son. Even though we know he had a, a, a son by Hagar, mm -hmm. but God calls him his son, his only son, because he was the son of the promise that mm -hmm. he 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 was promised a son in old age, and now we see an altar. What was that all about, Abraham with his son Isaac? How does that point to us, the cross? I, I think that that's the most vivid image for us of an ultimate sacrifice. A lot of people can imagine offering themselves uh, as a sacrifice. You know, soldiers have to face this reality when they go into battle, that they are laying down their lives. But we, we can't quite wrap our mind around offering our beloved children. I mean, that, that's too much for us. You know, our, the mind just shuts down. And yet that's what God seemed to be asking of Abraham. Now, God knew from the beginning how the story was going to end. But this was Abraham's great test. This was his second vocation. He was called to the promise, as you said. He was promised land. He was promised offspring. He was promised all of these great things. But did he really believe the promise? This was his test, and he passed the test with flying colors. The angel came and stayed his hand when he was about to make the ultimate priestly act that a human male, uh, a father, can imagine. He was going to offer his only son on an altar. You know, God intended that to show that that uh, that that the kind of act that the father the father did when when he sent his son into the world this is something profound it's more profound than we could ever wrap our mind around he gave his he asked abraham to give his very very best yes you know, when you have a son when you're young it's 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 huge to have a son after your wife is no longer fertile in your yes. old age but yes. but here's the thing where did this take place i mean he he calls he says abraham go to the place i'm going to show you had, abraham i think had to, got up early in the morning and had to walk, I think, several days. And and where exactly was this altar, Mike? <laughs> well, according to tradition, it was in what would later be Jerusalem, you know, the place of the temple where where the offerings would be made from Israel. Uh, the offerings and atonement for the sins of the people would be made, would be made there, you know, as far as the Israelites co were concerned, forever. OK, Jer Jerusalem, though, is also the place where God's only son would be offered in sacrifice in the atoning sacrifice that was once for all and the only sacrifice that was sufficient to take away sins. So he so he traveled several days, just the father and the son mm -hmm. traveling and he gets to this place, Mount Moriah, which is they right next to Golgotha, right next to the temple. He went several days specifically to go to that mountain. Yes. That's that foreshadow. Okay, now I want to ask you this question. Jesus is on the cross. Mm -hmm. uh, he's, he is giving all that he can. The Father is giving all that he can by giving us his son uh, to show us his own sacrifice, his love for us. And he dies. And the high priest enters the Holy of Holies. The temple curtain is torn from the top down. Tell us about that moment. 
Well, that moment marks the end of sacrifice in the temple. You know, now the once for all sacrifice has been consummated. And eventually that once for all sacrifice will be extended to the entire world through the mass because our Lord said in his offering, do this in remembrance of me. And the church would always do this in his memory. That would be the memorial sacrifice ever afterward. There would be no other sacrifice. All other acts of offering, all other sacrificial actions. Every morning, I make a morning offering. I am offering my day in union with the sacrifice of the cross and the sacrifice of the mass offered throughout the world. The prophet Malachi had predicted this when he said, from the rising of the sun to its setting, that pure offering would be made in the fullness of time, okay, when the Messiah came, the Messianic age. That would be the sign of the messianic age that the offering that was pure would be made from the rising of the sun to its setting always and everywhere and so yeah you see you see this now i've heard it said you know that uh, uh, some protestants say well you're re-sacrificing jesus you're re-killing no. him in mass so what does that mean exactly what it, tell us about that cosmic thing of of, of re, re, re t- tell us what it means to be made present again Catholics and Protestants agree that the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross was a once-for-all sacrifice. What Catholics believe about the Mass is that it is the representation of that sacrifice through all time. That this is the way Jesus willed for us when he said, do this in remembrance of me. This is the way he willed for us to have contact with that moment because he wasn't just dying for those who were standing at the foot of the cross. He was dying for all mankind. And so he wanted us to be able to experience that sacrifice up close and in a personal way. And he said, when he talked about his offering, when he preached about it in one of his longest sermons, he said that we would eat his flesh and drink his blood. And if we didn't do that, we would have no life in us. Well, he said, this is my body. He said, this is the cup of my blood. And he said, do this in remembrance of me so that we would know how to check into that sacrifice and be one with him through the sacrifice. Yeah, but Mike, that couldn't be right that Jesus wants us to eat his flesh and drink his blood. I mean, but but here's what happens. Uh, <laughs> he, he's like the uncle that shows up at Christmas and you're like kind of embarrassed of him, right? That, you know what I mean? <laughs> yes. So the, yes, so they kept challenging it. Yeah, so the Protestants are like, no, 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 that you know, that can't be. That just can't be. But if it weren't so, he had just fed the, the thousands, and then he, then he, makes this PR blunder worse than any Donald <laughs> Trump blunder, right? Eat yeah. my flesh and drink my blood. They go, and he lost all of his disciples because of it, except for the few. He even said to his apostles, "Are you two going to leave me?" He lost thousands yeah. of followers yeah. because he made that truth that truth statement. If it was just supposed to be a, a uh, you know, a symbol, uh, then he would have said, he would have clarified with a P- public a press release or something. But he didn't. Right. No, well, and they well, gave him every opportun- opportunity through the questions they asked. But tell me about when Jesus appeared to the disciples on the road to Emmaus then. And, uh, you know, that's another sign that this is what he wanted. You know, as soon as he rises from the dead, what's the first thing he does? He walks on the road to Emmaus. He opens up the scriptures for them, and then he is made known to them in the breaking of the bread. They knew him in the breaking of the bread. And then what happens? From there, from the end of St. Luke's Gospel, we go to the Acts of the Apostles, and we find that this is what the church is all about. Everywhere the church breaking goes. Of the, reading of the word, breaking of the bread, reading of the word, breaking of the bread, again and again and again and again. Liturgy of the word, liturgy of the, uh, liturgy of the mass. And that's what, what we're what, doing today. Yeah, what's so cool <laughs> about Emmaus, at Emmaus is here's Jesus. He's, he's doing what we kind of did, only probably a little bit better maybe. Yeah. He went from the Old Testament and, and explained all the verses about him. And then he blesses the, ble- blesses the bread. Yes. And they, he's gone. He blesses the bread and he disappears, but he's not gone. He's there. He's in the after after that blessing bear. I mean, you know that (laughs) he's really present. They don't need to see flesh and blood. 
physical body. Physical, he's right there. He's right there in the in the host. Mike, we ran out of time. The horse needs to get into the barn <laughs> again. Did you? Isn't this? Isn't it a we great do conversation? This every time. <laughs> isn't this a great conversation? It is so wonderful. It is. And too bad Mike doesn't have any you know passion about this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mike's uh, website is fathersofthechurch.com. There's so many great books. What would be a good book for Father's Day, Mike? Oh, uh, The Fathers of the Church. Oh, there you go. That's one of one of his titles of his books. Or oh, you go to my website, deepadventure.com, and we all got all kind of stuff there, too. Hey, I want to remind everybody, we are going to Greece in May. We're going to be traveling in the footsteps of St. Paul. And, uh, of course, you can't go to Greece without a cruise because you it's a lot of it is islands. We're going to go to Greece. Philippi, Thessalonica, Athens, Ephesus, Island of Patmos. And we're just happening to stop by at Mykonos and Santorini at the end of the cruise. So it'll be partial land, partial cruise. Uh, go to our website and find out more about our, our adventure to Greece. Aloha, Mike Aquilina. Thank you. Hey, thanks for having me. Okay, aloha.